old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts. Bill Barley's with me today. Usually we go to a place. Today we go with a man to a whole series of places. We've done a thing on railroaders. These, this is the newspaper man. Which particular newspaper man? Well, Robert Thornton Lowry. And, and you talk about a lot of newspaper men in the West, Mike, and you talk about Bob Edwards, who's probably better known the old Calgary Eye Opener. Everybody quotes him. Sure they do. Couldn't touch Lowry. Line for line, Lowry was the best new newspaper editor in British Columbia, and nobody comes close, not Houston or anybody else in the West. And all you have to do is go over the back copies of Lowry and read what he has to say. And this is a very fascinating guy, born in, in Helton County in, in Ontario, brought up and, and learned the newspaper business in a place called Petrolia. And then came west, early, uh, early 1890s, late 1880s, probably 89. Went into Vancouver and established a paper called the Ozonogram. <laughs> you know, the Vancouver. The Did Ozonogram. Sure. Didn't like Vancouver. It was too big for him, so he left Vancouver, and he heads for a little part of British Columbia, which he found very attractive. And this is the Silvery Slope Canyon. And so he established really 10 newspapers plus a magazine in his, in his newspapering experience. And that's almost 30 years in British Columbia. So he establishes the Ozonogram. Then he comes into Caslow, the Caslow claim. Then he goes from Caslow, he jumps over to the cusp, and he has the cusp ledge. Then he jumps down from the cusp into New Denver and has the New Denver ledge. Then he goes up into Sandon and has the Sandon pastry. Interesting thing, Mike, is this, is that every name of each paper he referred to as a mining name. You know, the pay streak is, is a mining term, and the ledge is a mining term, and the claim is a mining term. So he goes from sand, and he goes into Rossland, and he establishes Rossland's golden claim. Then he jumps back in there again and goes up to Poplar and establishes the Poplar Nugget. Poplar doesn't last. He goes down into Slocan City and establishes the Slocan Drill. That doesn't last. He jumps over to Fernie and establishes another ledge called the Fernie Ledge. And finally, at the end of his career, Mike, he comes back into an old, old town in British Columbia, Greenwood, and establishes his last newspaper. This is the Greenwood Ledge. Okay. So today, we're going to take from some of the actual papers. Bill actually has some of the papers that Robert Thornton Lowry published, and he's got quotes from all sorts of other ones. We're going to follow him as he jumps around British Columbia and talks about the people, talks about the times, takes on the bad guys and the good guys, Robert Thornton Lowry after this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're talking about Robert Thornton Lowry, a newspaper publisher and editor, 1893, after he gets finished with this ozonogram, and where he ever got the name for that paper, where did he head to? First well, he, he heads to the booming town on Kootenai Lake on the west side of Kootenai Lake, and that's Caslow. And here's a photograph of Caslow in 1893. Caslow is on its way. Thousands of people, literally thousands of people are streaming into Caslow. It is at that time the biggest town in the West Kootenai district. Now, now there is a thing about Lowry, uh, it's sort of a failing, but oh. it's also one of strong. What, what was he yeah. famous for? Well, I quoted in one of my stories I did on him. This guy had the unerring capacity to pick the right town at the wrong time. So That's he arrives all. in Caslow, how far after, after it's sort of... Uh, <laughs> well, insane. actually, Mike, what happened? He arrived in Caslow in 1893, and that's the right time. Because, you know, but he gets there, and he establishes a newspaper. He has six people working for him, including himself. And, uh, and in fact, here's what he says when he comes into town. This is kind of interesting, Mike. Caslow has a new paper. The proprietors are bulletproof and own ten lots in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows his paper is going to be... You know, yeah, a little yeah. bit questionable, because this guy tackles everybody. You know, his favorite targets, of course, were the CPR. And local politicians, the judiciary, especially some of the judges, which we felt were, were biased in some of, their, some of their decisions, and, of course, deadbeat businessmen. And, uh, and he has no, he has no favorites. He is, uh, he is a very fascinating guy. You know, he's, uh, he's a frontier Democrat who's a bigot. He's... Um, an individual who professes to be an agnostic Mike, and he's Christian in the true sense of the word. So in my books, he's one of the most famous of all the old 
newspaper men in the Old what? West. A man of conflicts, an sure. enigma. Sure he was. Okay. He, he takes a shot at nearby towns, too. He always did this. He said, and Nelson, well, what of Nelson? She is relegated to her accustomed quietude. And Kasler, which kept her alive last winter, will doubtless extend a helping hand again. He was wrong, of course. You see, Kasler goes down in population. And the reason it goes down, silver, the silver price drops in 1893, a real depression. And the, and the bank in Kasler closes, which I mentioned in our, in our program in Kasler, Burke's Bank. And so after 16 weeks of operating as a very high-profile newspaper and attracting a lot of readers, widespread acclaim, and some very, very bitter enemies as well, he has to close down the newspaper. And he, after and 16 weeks? After only 16 weeks. And what he puts, what he puts in is this, Mike. Well, this is, we, I've seen this before. This yeah. is the, we the tombstone it. issue. That's the tombstone issue. Of the Caslow claim. Yeah. Busted by gosh. Yeah. He says, Saucy is the devil. And there it is. There's the tombstone. Born May 12th, 93, died 16 weeks later, August 25th, 1893. Age 16 weeks. Let her rest in peace. Yeah, let her rip. Let her rip. That's what I should have Oh, said. yeah, you bet. R.I.P. Let what her What did he rip. do elsewhere in that, well, when he published that issue? What he did here is really quite amusing. And what he says is this, and this is his parting shot, and he fires a volley various number of people here. The claim goes up the shaft today and will be deposited in the journalistic boneyard with the amount of regret customary on such occasions. Its career has been short, but not altogether peaceful. Its readers have been numerous. It has made some friends and a few enemies. The pastry having entirely disappeared, we are forced to prospect somewhere else. He brings in the mining terminology, you see. In the, to the few staunch friends who have helped us with their money and sympathy, we extend our sincere thanks. To our enemies, this article will be pleasant reading. Our suspension will enable them to bamboozle the public without any fear of being molested, and consequently, they will be happy. Four months ago, this paper had the brightest prospects in Canada. Today, everything has changed. Such is life in the wild and silvery West. One day, a prospective millionaire, the next, nothing to live on but wind and one of Burke's checks. That's the bank. Yeah, checks that wind broke. Oh, sure. In lieu of crepe, we have hung the, the printing office towel on the doorknob, turn off the gas, ring down the curtain, and exclaim, the play is over, the flag is hauled down, the casual claim is dead, extremely dead. This did not deter <laughs> him. Where did he uh, not take a his... Not Because I guess what he had to do was he had to pick up his printing press sure. and what little belongings he has and, sure. and trundle off to where he thought the next place was, sure. arriving maybe a bit late. What was his next stop? Well, his next stop actually is in the cusp, and he establishes another mining newspaper there, and he calls it the ledge. He, so he switches from the claim to the, the ledge. ledge. The ledge is a mining term. Yeah, but he made a mistake. In the cusp at that particular time, 1890, late 1893, wasn't really going for any place. So he decides to shift. He keeps the name, and he shifts down the lake to a beautiful little town down there called New Denver. And he establishes there the New Denver Ledge. And the New Denver Ledge is, is really quite a, quite a nice paper, indeed. And uh, this is something that he wrote, not for the New Denver Ledge, but just prior to that. And I, I should have mentioned this. A miner sends in, he writes a letter to Lowry. Lowry is, is in Caslow at this time. Yep. So we'll go back a little bit, but it's worth going back to, okay. Mike. And this guy encloses a three-cent stamp. Now, Lowry is going down, of course, in, in Caslow. And he says, Dennis, the miner's name was Dennis O'Brien. Dennis enclosed a three-cent stamp, for which we return thanks. A stamp is a rare thing in Caslow and very valuable. Although, unusually, you can get them in the post office. Unusually. Unusually. When Dennis arrives, we will endeavor to have the rain stop for a few minutes so he can invest 10 cents in a claim. This would enable us to live probably long enough to get an ad from some of our enterprising merchants. Hurry up, Dennis, and don't forget to bring some more stamps with you. <laughs> the slightest component was material that would stimulate him to write more about various other things, right? Oh, sure. So he had to comment on everything that was going down in, yeah. in, in any part of the, the community. Sure. Here's what else he says. A couple of businessmen uh, gave him a hard time. So he, he straightens up on these guys. S.W.C., who tried to make soft drinks in New Denver, and Spry Palmer, who tried to run a show in Sandin, are both deadbeats. You wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> That's pretty straight talk. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Yeah. And the wide world would do well to look out for them. They are likely to end up in Hades, for both of them are guilty of cheating the printer, which is about the meanest thing a man can do on Earth. Men who would do such things would steal a shroud from a corpse. 
No. <laughs> so now, what are these guys' names? These, these are it's Fry Palmer yeah. and uh, S. W. C. Yeah. And whoever got this man's paper, yeah. th that recommendation would carry. Oh, that would stay with them for the rest of their lives if they stayed in the Kootenai district. Some we of tried them. to make soft drinks. Some <laughs> of them did. In vicious fruit. And it, it, it shows how capable this guy was. And this is again writing in the New Denver Ledge. And he says this. We have received several requests recently to go east and labor upon some of the leading newspapers, and probably the Globe and Mail. Probably the Globe and Mail, Mike. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, you'll take a look at this. This is the famous this Lowry letterhead. Look at this. This letterhead is outrageous. Oh, sure it is. And is this, I presume, is Lowry? That's Lowry. Oh, yeah. Money oh. underneath the table. Yep. Uh, old roasts in here. These are these are scripts. people he is. Oh yes, people he's gone after. Books of knowledge. Uh, knowledge, sure. Ledge, of course, prominently displayed. And over in the corner, of course, is his dog, and that's his dog, Kino. And you know, Lowry was was an interesting guy. He delinquent was, uh, subscriber being the, the, the being, arm of a delinquent oh, subscriber sure. being torn off. And this this is signed by a guy who calls himself Jack Spratt, but his real name is Ben Goss, and he was a cartoonist for the Toronto Globe and Mail. Now, the fact that Lowry could get this guy to do this for him, what did that say? Well, it showed how, what, what esteem he was held, held in by all the other newspaper editors in the West, including Ben Goff, who was a cartoonist of note, probably the most famous in Canada, and, of course, including Bob Edwards, who was a famous editor in the West, who knew Lowry extremely well. So that they wanted to hire him back east, but here's what he says. He goes on to say, We decline all such requests. We prefer to live in the ideal spot of North America, where the ozone is high-grade, and the inhabitants only wear white shirts occasionally, where the trailblazer sits at the same table as the millionaire, and near, nearly everybody is a colonel, or at least a captain. What a <laughs> wonderful piece well, of work. You see, he was a bogus colonel. There's no way that Robert Thornton Lowry, who called himself Colonel Lowry, was a real colonel. But he wore the title like he was a real colonel. And, you know, he's very, he very well dressed, and we will see a, a shot of this, of this, uh, this, this photograph of Lowry, which indicates Lowry at his at absolute best, dressed up in evening clothes, and uh, possessed of an extremely sharp mind, Mike. He uh, was not a large person. He spoke giant words, but out of a tiny frame. Oh, sure he did, yeah. And he, he had some flaws. You know, he was uh, inclined to, to partake of, the, uh, of wine more than he should <laughs> and other hard liquors. Uh, he liked dogs and cats. He was very fond of animals, and he was very fond of playing poker. In fact, he would resort to the poker table when the cash flow got low. And he was such a marvelous poker player that uh, people began to steer wide of him. He played a fair game, but he was, he was very analytical and was able to pay his way, uh, get, a, get a paper started, usually at the poker table. And occasionally he went on the holidays. The only holiday I know he went on, Mike, was this one. He goes back to the Great Lakes, and he, I guess he's looking over the offer from these papers back east. Yeah. So he decides to go back, and he boards a steamer on the Great Lakes, and he sits down for, for supper, and the waiter comes along, but he doesn't call him a waiter. And this article is very interesting because he refers to everything and alludes to it in mining terminology. And here's what he said. I called for a beefsteak. The disguised duke, that's the, the waiter, waiter. Okay. <laughs> was no doubt a poor judge of human nature and evidently thought that from my dove-like appearance, a very small guy, I must have an appetite like a hummingbird, for he bought me a steak that wasn't a full claim. <laughs> it was a fraction, essentially, you see. It looked like a fraction that had been staked under the old law. And I refused to take an option on it. Another minor yeah. turn. The Duke then produced a group of stakes, and I bonded them. <laughs> Marvelous. After doing development work for a few minutes, I ran into a pasty of potatoes and onions, which soon pinched out and left nothing in sight but a plate of strawberries. I worked this claim to a finish, and then bidding the, the Duke adieu, I went off shift. That's great stuff. He wrote this oh, sure. for everybody. Yep. I mean, when he wrote something in his paper, it was uh, to inform from a news point yep. of view. It was to criticize from mm -hmm. a political point of view. It was to just entertain from a, oh, from sure. a sheer entertainer's oh, point sure. of view. Sure. And what, what is the most intriguing thing about this guy is this, Mike, is that when he, when he established the Caslow claim and he left Caslow, a lot of those subscribers stayed with him. Went over to Nacusp, left Nacusp, some of those Nacusp subscribers stayed with him. Went to New Denver. And when he left New Denver and went up to the, to the, to the silver city of the Slocan, which was a, a boisterous town, Sandon, and here's Sandon in its heyday, and it's, it's really quite remarkable. And this is 1896, and of course, and uh, 
after we show the main street shot of Santa, we have another shot of the upper part of town. And here in the upper part of town, you can see on the right-hand side of this photograph, a little sign, and it says the Pay Street. And guess whose newspaper office that is? I couldn't possibly <laughs> guess. You actually happen to have a sure copy of the Pay Street. Yep. Not a broadsheet. Looks like a bit of a tabloid. Yep. And this is dated 1902. So mm -hmm. January 3rd, 1902, yep. the words of Robert Thornton Lowry come roaring out of here. Let me read a couple to you. Go for it. Go okay. for it. And a couple of these are this, Mike. And here's what he says. Nine men killed at the Molly Gibson mine. And this shows some of his biases as well. Nine men were killed at the Molly Gibson mine on Christmas night by the most destructive slide that has ever occurred in the history of the Slocan country. And this happened all the time in the Slocan, but not nine men usually. The slide came in the middle of the night, carrying away the bulk of the bunkhouse in which the men were sleeping. Some of the victims were carried two miles down the hill where their bodies were found afterwards by the relief expedition when at, which went up from Nelson. The names of those killed by the slide were M. E. Hall, S. M. Campbell, L. Brulee, W. Collins, W. Murphy, T. Rouse, two Italians and the Chinese cook. Why wouldn't the Italians and the Chinese cook get identified or, or receive a similar kind of... Well, it's his bigotry coming in and shows the hierarchy of the mining camps. And so the, the Chinese were at the lower echelon of that. And it does show the fatal flaw, at least one of the flaws of, of Lowry at the time. Not unusual, Mike. Doesn't it just show the flaw of society? Because that's the way society was at that time. It was, uh, I mean, the Chinese didn't have a vote. They, yeah. they did, couldn't own property. And yeah. uh, Italians were recent immigrants recent at the immigrants, time. Sure. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we've yeah. evolved, thank oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this same paper has a, lo a lot of gems. Here's, here's one of the others in here. Talking about the hockey club. The hockey club has secured possession of the old lockup. That's the old jail. And they use it as a dressing room and training quarters. So they had no problem in Santa and going into the old jail. And that's where they, that's where they changed and they went in. And this shows what he, what he thought of a stray cat. He was always picking up stray cats. The pay streak has a cat, which chews roller composition and sterilized fog. Its parentage is mysterious. But as its behavior is good, we overlook the lack of a pedigree. It is a blonde. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> The pastry. Uh, now, yeah. there are some other things in here. I want to just take a look at these because advertising yeah. is an interesting component yeah. of today's media. Sure. And I presume it was at that time. Sure. And if the Filbert Hotel didn't yeah. pay its bill, you could count on Robert Thornton Lowry taking them to task. Oh, Fashionable sure. tailoring. Sure. Was easy. A Happy New Year to all our customers yeah. from McDonald and Ross. Yeah. Subscribe to the pastry and be up to date. Sure. What a great... Sure. The Miner's Cafe. Yep. Over on this side, meal tickets, five bucks. The best yep. short order house in the city. Mm -hmm. How many years did he publish the pastry? Uh, about six years. And then he left, of course, but some other things he put in the pastry. Okay. And here's, here's from the pastry, Mike, and this is, this is quite good. And, of course, this is right in the heart of the mining country, you know, where a lot of individuals came in with all sorts of propositions. Mining experts of all types are exceedingly numerous this summer. The yellow-legged species are very conspicuous. Yellow-legged? Yeah. The dude expert with the white pants and the scientific expression of countenance is also here. And the expert expert is occasionally in sight. His clothes are generally covered with candle grease, powder soot, and other things that a man might rub against underground. This kind is an expert, all right. He may look like a tramp who's been chased by a bulldog, but if he says a mine is worth so much, you may depend upon it. Unless he has an interest in it. A little warning, Basically. a little warning. Oh, yeah, great stuff. Got to take a break here, but we'll be back in just a second with more of Robert Thornton Lowry and his activities. Not only did he publish papers, he published a magazine, which is interesting in its own right. So we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns, or the Robert Thornton Lowry Show. He yeah. proceeded apace through the south sure. part of BC. Left Sandon, went into Rossland, established the Golden Claim there. Left Rossland, went into Poplar, which is a little, very small camp. Established the Poplar Nugget, disappeared from there. Went into Slocan City, established the Slocan Drill. And finally, after failing in all those newspapers, he goes to the East Kootenai and establishes the Fernie Ledge. But he gets into a big battle with the coal company and with the mayor of the town. And the mayor of the town gets his own back 
when he refuses to let a touring company advertise in the Fernie Ledge with, with, with uh, Lowry because he said, if they do, they won't, or they won't play in my opera house. And Lowry gets his own back, and here's what he writes about Mayor Fred Stork of Fernie. Our baby mayor should feel proud of his great victory. He should hang it up with his soldier clothes. The mayor was, uh, was in the militia. It will help, it helped him to forget the sad bungle he made of his terrific onslaught upon the BC Telephone Company when he caused the ratepayers of this city to lose thousands of dollars by showing what a muddle-brained fool will do when he is turned loose. Close in a few, a little brief authority. Still, perhaps Stork should not be judged too severely for his actions. He may have pumpkinitis and not be able to control himself. Although idiots and lunatics are put where they cannot cause loss and annoyance to the community. Well, the result of that, Mike, is is that he has to pull up stakes again, and he goes this time to Greenwood in that deep in the boundary country, and this is his last stop, Mike, really. And he, uh, he comes in Greenwood in 1906 and stays there really till 1920, the longest stay he's ever had. He brings his subscribers with him. When he comes to Greenwood, here's what he said. The Greenwood ledge comes to the front in Greenwood in a quiet and unobtrusive manner. The plant, which is all paid for, has been unloaded in the Copperopolis without ringing a bell, firing a cannon, or filling the air with the spasm of a brass band. It encountered no rifle-laden pickets at the outer wall. A more mellow man? Much more so. But he still had some humor. Says this about the editor in Grand Forks. At Grand Forks, the dust is so thick that it has caused a local editor to write a poem. He has not yet been apprehended by the police. <laughs> a critic. A <laughs> oh. definite critic. Oh, sure. He also published a magazine, a monthly, which he called The Float. And there it is, volume one, number one. And there's some gems in this. And a few of the gems he makes comments like this. Ike Lawhage accidentally shot his partner on Toad Mountain. That's near Nelson. And the body was buried in a coffin made of whipsawed lumber. Excellent. You bet he didn't accidentally shoot him. Then he goes on to see, he meets an old friend downtown in Nelson. And the old friend says, gosh, Colonel, I'm glad to see you. I want to buy you a drink. Can you lend me two bits? <laughs> and finally, he says this. He who has never toyed with cards saves himself endless misery, but lacks an experience that pairs the top off human nature and lays bare the quivering passions that shake the human soil in its desire for gold, but without labor. That says the gambler to a T. Sure it does. Desire for gold without labor. So he stays in Greenwood till 1920s in his 60s now. He then sell, sells out to Billy Smith, G.W.A. Smith, and he goes, goes into the hospital in Grand Forks, and he passes away in the hospital in Grand Forks in 1921, and he's buried by the old timers in the Kootenays in Nelson in the old Nelson Cemetery. A lot of people show up. His subscribers, were they there? Hundreds of subscribers are there to pay their last respects to what I consider the greatest newspaper editor in the West, Bar none. Can we see his grave to this day? Can we go to Nelson and... Strange thing, Mike. Uh, there's no... The grave is not marked, and I will... I'm going to try to find out exactly where Robert Thornton was buried, because that's 1921, and I probably can. Robert Thornton Lowry, our very own, just remarkable, legendary newspaper publisher and editor, 10 newspapers, plus a magazine called The Float, and Bill's read from number one, volume one, Thank you for joining us tonight. See you next time. Bye-bye.